this rolling. By the way, I do appreciate all the, the volunteers that help with these cameras. Okay. Any time. Fortunate. Any time now. So. Okay. <laughs> Let's just bow our heads. Again, Father, we thank you for the chance to be here, be with David in a special way, to watch over us, be with our church, be with our country. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> thank you, Forrest, and thank you all for being here. How many of you were here last week? I am. Um, noticed that there were a variety of responses to what we heard. Some were perplexed, others were maybe a little bit apprehensive, and maybe, though I didn't run into these people, there were some who were, were pleased by oh, what we heard. I am particularly happy that we did not discuss it last week. I think it was good that Dr. Brandstater took the whole time so that we would have an opportunity to think about these matters uh, before immediately responding to them. We have a tendency, I think, sometimes to react, maybe not overreact, but to react uh, perhaps more swiftly than we should and I think some time here will give us an opportunity for reflection. Dr. Brandstater will be back, I think in the middle of October. He could not be here today, and that's why I'm stepping in. Excuse me. <clears throat> I would like my remarks today not to be understood as a response to him, but as a sort of background material for our discussion, because I think the more we have in mind the wide range of Christian views about these matters, the better off we are. I would particularly like to look at the writings of Jonathan Edwards because he is known to be one of the most original and significant philosophers of religion or philosophy of any kind in the entire history of the United States. Many people know him only for that one rather vigorous sermon, but he is well known elsewise for a very, very penetrating mind and one that was well aware of the philosophical currents in his time, both in what we call the United States and in Europe. And his writings are still pondered today. There's a big Jonathan Edwards Center at Yale, but there are Jonathan Edwards Centers all over the world, and they are increasing in number, not decreasing in number. So Jonathan Edwards is by no means receding in influence. He is actually growing in influence. And as the charismatic movement of our time becomes more and more influential, many people are going back to the writings of Jonathan Edwards to discover what we might learn from them. I learned about Jonathan Edwards from Roy. Roy Branson in a class back at the seminary. I can't now recall if it was a class in ethics or a class in the development of American theology. I suspect it was the second one. I do recall reading two books with John, by Jonathan Edwards with uh, Roy. One of them was The Nature of True Virtue and the other one was Religious Affections. And both of those caught my attention and have been close to me all through the years. The Nature of few, uh, True Virtue is about what a genuinely excellent person's character looks like. And Jonathan Edwards' answer to that is, a virtuous person is one who consents to being in general. Huh? Yeah. consents to being in general. And his argument throughout the book is that we have a tendency to have narrow and parochial loyalties. And as we mature, the scope of our loyalties, the circumference of our loyalties, gets larger and larger and larger until that encompasses the whole universe. And that's what he means by being, in general, everything that is, particularly everything that is insofar as it is divine. Being, in general, is a word that, uh, an expression that Jonathan Edwards would use for God. And so the question comes up, was he a pantheist? 
And the answer to that is, well, that depends upon what one means by being a pantheist. Uh, remember that at one point in the Institutes of the Christian Religion, John Calvin said, those who understand things will be correct if they say nature and God are the same thing. But it's important to understand what is being said when those uh, comments are made. So we can think of three different forms of pantheism. One of them is the most um, inaccurate one. That's the idea that God is in everything. That is not pantheism. That's the omnipresence of God. All, all Christians believe that. Spinoza's view was that God and, the nat and nature were the same. One might draw a circle around the universe as a whole and draw a circle around God and they would be indistinguishable. Uh, indistinguishable. Help me. Indistinguishable. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. So around. Uh, now, however, if one looks a little closer at Spinoza, Spinoza, Spinoza is not saying as such that the universe is God, but the being of the universe is God. And we recall that for Spinoza, there is one actuality, uh, so his is a monistic philosophy, and the particular things in the universe are monads, uh, kind of coming up out of that one reality. So if we equate the word nature with these particularities, no, that's not what God is, but God is the the essence or the substance or the beingness, we might say, of all that is. And if that's what one means by, by um, pantheism, then I think we would say that Jonathan Edwards was a pantheist. Parenthetically, Jack Provencher had a lot of good to say about pantheism. He felt like it fell short with regard to the issue of freedom. But my best encapsulation of Jack Provence's doctrine of God is to say that for him, God is the unity of all unities. So every particular thing is a unity of some sort. My, my life, my body, so it's yours. But our unities belong to larger unities and larger ones to larger ones and still further. And God is the unity of all those other unities. And that's why I think, as you've heard me say, when uh, we drove by a Uni um, Unitarian church one time in Northern California, and Jack said to me, you know, if I hadn't been an Adventist, I would like to have been a Unitarian because this emphasis upon the unity of all things was important to him. Now, Dr. Vasha was a Trinitarian. That was not what he was aiming for. Uh, the the uh, undifferentiated singularity of God is not what uh, Dr. Vasha was trying to aim at. He was trying to think about the unity of all things. And uh, I think it's fair to say some people see the universe in all of its diversity, and other people see the universe in all of its unity, and Dr. Pavancha was one who saw it in its unity, and so was Jonathan Edwards, and so was Spinoza. So these were all sort of um, um, somewhat in the same family. But there is what's called the Spinoza conundrum, because Spinoza said, as you remember, he was a Jewish man who uh, fell out of favor with the synagogue there in the Netherlands and they didn't treat him very well but uh, because they thought his doctrine of God wasn't orthodox enough. What, what Spinoza said is that the idea of God in the biblical religions is not false, it's just incoherent. It doesn't make sense on its own terms, which is an important point. Before we can ask whether God is actual or not, we have to ask whether the notion of God we're working with is inherently coherent. And Spinoza's point was that no, the biblical God, the concept of the biblical God, biblical God is not uh, conceptually coherent. Why, Spinoza said, because God is ostensibly perfect. But if God creates something other than God, that must be because there was some deficiency in God in the first place. 
So either God was not intentional when God created the universe, which is contrary to scripture, or um, there was some lack in God that prompted God to create the universe to fill that emptiness in God's own being. Well, that's where Jonathan Edwards had to step in and his last book called Dissertations on the Christian Religion or something like that is very complicated and I haven't read my way all the way through it but I have got to the end of it and I think Jonathan Edwards says the right thing about that and that is to say it is part of God's nature to be creative. God does not someday say well no, I'm using my language, not Jonathan Edwards, right? God does not say someday, well, this morning I think I'll be creative and put out there a universe. No, uh, Jonathan Edwards' point is that Spinoza missed the idea that in God's own nature there is an essential creativity that always overflows in something other than God. And so from that point of view, there has never been God without a universe, and never a universe without God, because uh, God's essential creativity uh, necessarily causes God to uh, create that which is not God. And I think that's exactly right. Uh, and you see people in our time making that move as well. Now, what's happening is that in our lives, we can distinguish between the nature of something, the nature of our lives, and the choices we make, the being of something, and the action of something. But uh, for God, the concept of God that Jews, Christians, and Muslims have is that the, the action of God and the being of God are one and the same. So, uh, you know, someone who's just radically different from all of this is Karl Barth will say that in God's own constitution, God wills to be that which is not God. So God was never home alone. There was always that which God was in the process of creating. That does not mean that what God had other than God was this planet or this solar system or what we call the universe. All it means is that there is that which is not God in which uh, God is working to bring about as much perfection as possible. So, it's, a, it's an interesting topic and I think it's a, an important topic because it goes to the heart of what we understand God to be like. Are we saying that it would be possible for God to be God without being creative? And I think, if we put it that way, quite a few of us would want to say no. So, now back to Jonathan Edwards. His father was a pastor uh, who had a little difficulty making ends meet, so he was a tutor for people, children who were wanting to go to school. Uh, Edwards was a very astute young fellow and wrote careful notes from his observations of insects and so forth, and uh, eventually landed up at Yale and uh, did well there. Um, then landed up in New York City for a while as a pastor, but eventually came back out to um, Northampton, I think it was, where he was the assistant pastor of the church that his grandfather pastored. It was the most prosperous and uh, influential congregation in that area at that time, and he was the associate minister. But his grandfather died, and so he inherited that pastorate and he took it very seriously. Jonathan Edwards had come from a family in which there were 11 children, and he was number five, but he was the only boy. He and his wife had 11 children, but they had the good fortune, they thought, of having three boys, and not just one. Everyone says that Sarah uh, Pierpont, whom he married, was a very impressive woman. He himself, in his journal, says that he had recently encountered uh, a woman of unusual attractiveness in, in intelligence and piety, and she's 13 years old. <laughs> so he waited until she was 17, and then they married. And they had a wonderful marriage. People say that uh, their home was filled with tranquility and joy uh, and happiness and hardly a word uh, cross with a crossword was shared between them. George Whitfield visited them 
when he was single and he said the Edwards family is so uh, tranquil and joyful I want to get married so that it had a, that kind of impact uh, people say that she was a very very um, buoyant and courageous in the face of adversity and provided uh, the family the kind of openness that was needed because Jonathan Edwards tended to be somewhat private and reclusive. After all, his schedule, as he made it, required him to study 13 hours a day. Every day, 13 hours a day. One hour a day for his children, and then the rest he could do whatever he wanted to do with. But he really took seriously the role of a pastor as a teacher. <laughs> Uh, now, he does say in his own journals, you know, my wife has, has uh, times of melancholy. <laughs> and sometimes that almost overwhelms her. So what does that mean? When I asked Brahma that, she said, that means she was human. <laughs> maybe she was lonesome. Maybe lonesome, yeah. I think it means he wasn't helping her with the kids. <laughs> that, could, that could well be. That could well be the case. So one John, hour a day wasn't enough. I'm sorry. One hour a day. One hour a day wasn't enough. I should think with 11 children eventually that they probably needed a little more, more attention than that. So he was a pastor, but it did not go well because two things, somewhat quite contrary. He was part of the New Light people who accepted the revivals that were going on, whereas many of the people were quite suspicious of the revivals of the First Awakening. So he was sort of out of step with this rather comfortable and prosperous and dignified uh, congregation that was a little scandalized by all of this commotion created by the uh, First Great Awakening. But the other, the other thing though is that he was um, perhaps more stringent than the people in that congregation preferred and he made the requirements for, for being a formal member of the congregation much more stringent than his grandfather had. And uh, that became a, a source of great stress. So here we have a young pastor who is very intellectualistic and then he's also somehow agreeable to this strange development and then he's really hard on our children uh, and says they can't be full members of the church unless they do everything he thinks they should show. Uh, he was overwhelmingly voted out. So he went out and worked with the um, Indians. He had opportunities to go to large pastorates, both here and in Scotland. But he went out and worked with the Indians for a while, and that gave him lots of time to study, as well as serve them, and as well as protect them from those who were taking their property. But in due course, he was invited to become one of the very first presidents of Princeton. Now, Sarah Pierpoint was the daughter of one of the founders of Yale. So she came from an academically uh, well-situated family. And Edwards himself did not come from so academically uh, positioned family, but he himself, by the force of his own intellect, had, become a, had come to their attention. So he was asked to become the first president at Princeton. Uh, and he was very much in favor of smallpox inoculations. He thought that this is something all the people should do, and in order to persuade them to do so, he took the vaccination himself, but it killed him. Uh, so his life was cut short. I think about, he was about 53 years of age. His wife had not moved down to Princeton yet. Uh, she was still uh, with the children back home, and he sent uh, tender greetings to her as he knew he was dying. And, uh, uh, she died six months later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They had a very, very close uh, marriage, and <clears throat> I'm not all sure what happened, but you know, we see that quite often, don't we? One spouse dies, and it's not too long before the other one does, too. That doesn't always happen, but it always frequently does. Excuse me? Before, when he dies. Oh. 
I'm sorry, Jeff. How old was he when he died? So he was born in what, 1703, and he died in 1756. It's so about 53, and he was six years older than she. So she would have been in her late 40s, something like that. So cause of her death? I don't know. That I don't know that. Were the children still some of them small? You know, I don't know that either. Let's say she got married when she was 17, and 30 years later she dies. Um, and she had 11 children. I asked my wife this morning, how, many, how often can a woman have children? Uh, and she said, whatever it was, she had too many. So uh, <laughs> I think that that's true. I don't think, well, I, I, that's more detail about that than I want to get into. But um, she, she had 48. many children. She was 48. 48, you looked it up. Boy, I hate these cell phones. <laughs> One can never say anything in class anymore without being checked. Whoa, I think I got close enough, didn't I? Oh, you did. I count that. It is. You know, that happens in class all the time. People check out what you're saying. You better be right. Uh, the, other, the other day I asked my medical students, my medical, freshman medical students, first day, tell me where you were. Write down where you were 10 years ago this morning, just to get something going. <clears throat> And one of the young medical students on the front row pulls out his smartphone to check to see where he was 10 years ago. I thought, whoa, the world is really getting uh, too, too dependent on these. Okay, so um, now back to the revivals. And it's interesting that Jonathan Edwards took a measured approach to this. On the one hand, he was very, very clear that affections are a feature, central feature, of genuine religion. And in that respect, he was like Wesley and like Whitfield, and a hundred years later, like Schleiermacher, who talked about the essence of religion to be in the realm of feeling, not in the realm of the intellect, which is interesting for um, Edwards to say this, uh, but Wesley would say it, my heart was strangely warmed, that sort of thing. Schleiermacher, I have this feeling of absolute dependence. Uh, you know, and for Roy, the, uh, the essence of the Christian life really was not intellectual, but it, it was this um, affect that uh, Jonathan Edwards talked about. But what did he mean by feeling? He didn't mean it uh, in the sense that we might think of it today. For Jonathan Edwards, the mind has two different uh, Functions. One of them is to understand itself and the world around it. The other is what he called the inclinations. And that is, that is the inclination is the way the mind is, tends toward this or that. When I think about it, I think of how a flower changes, moves around as it moves, some flowers will do this as it moves around the sun, uh, uh, as the sun passes by it. Uh, and that's what he meant by an inclination. We have, in addition to the ability to understand the world, we have inclinations that uh, give the sh our lives a certain shape, and the affections are intense experiences of the inclinations. They are not simply feelings as such, they are the very specialized feelings that are expressive of the inclinations of a person's mind. So he would say that these uh, religious affections were uh, or are a necessary part of the Christian life. Uh, but then he would say, you know, they can sort of get out of hand, but then we shouldn't dismiss them because they sometimes get out of hand. So the very first book he wrote was called The Religious Affections, and it was a very careful observation of what he was seeing. And I think that he does get to be called the first psychologist of religion, and probably the best one until William James, because he really wanted to study the religious phenomena as he saw it there and then. And, but then he was also a Christian theologian who stood back and looked at things, not merely analytically, but also by way of assessment to see what he thought was appropriate and not appropriate. But even those who do not uh, follow Jonathan Edwards in his religious assessment of, of all this believe that he was very uh, careful in his uh, uh, 
assess, uh, not assessment, but description of what was going on. So let me see if I can just look at the table of contents to illustrate what we're talking about here. So in part one, he talks about what the affections are and why they are part of true religion. But in part two, he goes through a number of things, 12 things that neither prove nor disprove that the affections are gen genuine. And it's an interesting list. He says that religious affections are very great or raised very high is no sign. That is, if the, if the affection is very intense, that tells us nothing one way or the other as to whether it's genuine. That they have great effects on the body is no sign. That they cause those who have them to be fluent, fervent, and abundant in talking of the things of religion is no sign. He's not condemning them. He's just saying they are not uh, necessarily evidence of genuine Christianity. That persons did not excite them of their own contrivance by their own strength is no sign. That they come with texts of scripture remarkably brought to mind is no sign. That there is an appearance of love in them is no sign. Persons having religious affections of many kinds accompanying one another is no sign. These are all things he saw. That comforts and joys seem to follow awakenings and convic convictions of conscience in a certain order is no sign. That they dispose persons to spend much time in religion and to be zealously engaged in the external duties of worship is no sign. That they much dispose persons with their mouths to praise and glorify God is no sign. Be careful when you hear a lot of God language. That they make persons that have them exceedingly confident that what they experience is divine and that they are in good, a good estate, that is, they've been called by God, not damned by God, is no sign. That the outward manifestations of them and the relations persons give of them are very affecting and pleasing to the godly is no sign. I'd like to go back and uh, take a look at one of these earlier. But then in part three, he talks about what <coughs> genuinely are signs. And some of these I understand more uh, clearly than others. One genuine sign of a true religious affection is that they arise from divine influences and operations on the heart. Now, uh, I would have thought that that's begging the question. Um, but it's also the case that he thought it discernible as to what came from God and what didn't. That, that I have a trouble, I don't really understand what's going on there. Uh, that divine things are not motivated by self-interest. One should love God for God's sake and for God's beauty and not out of any hope of reward for doing so. Insofar as our love for God is tainted with self-interest, it is not genuine, he would say. Now, we have to keep in mind that the word Jonathan Edwards would first and last use about God is beauty. He was just struck by the overwhelming beauty of God. And uh, therefore, to enjoy a great work of art in hopes that it will do anything other than cause one enjoyment for its own sake uh, is, um, is a really unfortunate thing. To look at a great work of art and say, well, what's in it for me is not quite what we not want. They arise from the mind's being enlightened to understand or apprehend divine things. 
They are attended with the conviction of the reality and certainty of divine things. They are attended with evangelical humiliation. They are attended with a change of nature. They are attempted with the lamb-like, dove-like spirit and temper of Jesus Christ. They are attended with a Christian tenderness of spirit. Remember, he said earlier on, none of us is fully realized in any of these ways, but these are the directions in which people who are Christians ought to be moving. They have beautiful symmetry and proportion. That is, their feelings have that. Feelings understood as I've described them. The higher they are raised, the more is a longing of soul after spiritual attainments increase. They have their exercises and fruit in Christian practice. Christian practice and holy life is a sign of sincerity to others. Christian practice is the chief evidence to ourselves, much to be preferred to the method of the first convictions, enlightenings, comforts, or any imminent discoveries or exercises of grace whatsoever. Here in number 12, he really is saying, I think, what matters is how you treat other people in your daily life, the practice of our daily lives. Now, I, have, uh, I would like to go back and just read from one chapter from selections from uh, part two, and also selections from part three, just to give us a sense of what he's about. look at what he says about bodily um, here. I think it's very interesting. He says it's no sign that affections have the nature of true religion or that they have not, that they have great effects on the body. Now his approach to this I think is rather a remarkable. He says all affections whatsoever have in some respect or degree an effect on the body. As was observed before, such is our nature, and such are the laws of union of soul and body, that the mind can have no lively or vigorous exercise without some effect on the body. So subject is the body to the mind, and so much do its fluids, especially the animal spirits, attend the motions and exercises of the mind, that there cannot be so much as an intense thought without an effect upon them. Then, he, well, let me just move through, through here. Great effects on the body certainly are no sure evidences that affections are spiritual, for we see that such effects often uh, often sometimes, oftentimes, arise from great affections about temporal things, and when religion is in no way concerned in them. Nor, on the other hand, do I know of any rule, any have to determine that gracious and holy affections, when raised as high as any natural affections, and have equally strong and vigorous exercises, cannot have great effect on the body. No such rule can be drawn from reason. I know of no reason why being affected I go too far? with God's glory, there you go, God's glory should not cause the body to faint as well as being affected with a view of Solomon's glory. And then he goes through scripture talking about how uh, people who reportedly encountered God had physical reactions. The psalmist, speaking of the vehement religious affections, he had speaks of an effect in his flesh or body besides what was in his soul, expressly distinguishing one from the other. And then he talks about Psalms 82. The prophet Habakkuk, uh, that such ideas of God's glory as are sometimes given in this world have a tendency to overhear the body, over, yeah, overhear the body is evident because the scripture gives us an account and that this has sometimes actually been the effect of those external manifestations God has made of himself to the saints. 
So, before I leave this head, I would further observe that it is, it is the plain, it is plain, the scripture often makes use of bodily effects to express the strength of holy and spiritual affections, such as trembling, groaning, being sick, crying out, panting, and fainting. Now if it be supposed that these are only figurative expressions to represent the degree of affection, yet I hope all will allow that they are fit and suitable figures to represent the high degree of those spiritual affections which the Spirit of God makes use of them to represent, which I do not see how there would be if these spiritual affections, let them be in never too high a degree, have no tendency to any such thing, but that on the contrary, they are the proper effects and sad tokens of false affection and the delusions of the devil. I cannot think God would commonly make use of things which are very alien from spiritual affection. So, he is not willing to say that they are from of the devil. On the other hand, he's not willing to say that we should have an uncritical view of them. Okay, so the same pattern occurs in all of his other chapters. On the one hand, he affirms what's happening. On the other hand, he expresses some cautions about it. But then on the other hand, he comes back and affirms it at the end. It, it was those affirmations that got him in trouble with his uh, congregation. Let me go back to see if I can find what I want in the page in part three. <clears throat> This is why I think uh, when we see and hear things that, that strike us as a little odd, we ought to be careful about being too dismissive. That doesn't mean we should be gullible, but we ought to be careful about being sure, being too certain that we know what's really going on here. Okay, here in part three, I want to think this one is, the, I love this one. They have beautiful symmetry and proportion the true affections do. Not, this, not that the symmetry of the virtues and gracious affections of the saints in this life is perfect. It oftentimes is in many things defective through the imperfections of grace for want of proper instruction through errors of judgment or some particular unhappiness of natural temper or defects in education and many other disadvantages that might be mentioned. But yet, there is in no wise that monstrous disproportion in grace, gracious affections and the various parts of true religion in the saints that is very commonly to be observed in the false religion and counterfeits of grace, of hypocrites. So the life of the Christian should be um, a balanced one. It is with hypocrites as it was with Ephraim of old at a time when God greatly complains of their hypocrisy. Ephraim is a cake not turned, half roasted and half raw. There is commonly no manner of uniformity in their affections. So he's going to give us a lot of illustrations of this. But particularly, one great difference between saints and hypocrites is this, that the joy and comfort of the former is attended with godly sorrow and mourning for sin. They have not only sorrow to prepare them for the first comfort, but after they are comfort, comforted and their joy established. Okay, as it is foretold of the church of God that they should mourn and loathe themselves for their sins after they were returned from the captivity and were settled in the land of Canaan, the land of rest, and the land that flows with milk and honey. So, you know, he's saying the people of Israel still had reasons to be repentant after they came back from Babylon, and we do too, after we've been converted. Okay. Not only is there often in hypocrites an essential deficiency as to the various kinds of religious affections, but also a strange partiality and disproportion in the same affections with proportion in others. A holy hope and holy fear go together in the saints as has been observed from the Psalms. 
but particularly coming down here, one great difference between saints and hypocrites is this. No, I, I've done that. Let's keep moving. Thus, as to the affection of love, some would make high pretenses and a great show of love to God and Christ, and maybe have been greatly affected with what they have heard or thought concerning them, but they have not a spirit of love and benevolence toward men. As to love to men, there are some that have flowing affections to some, but their love is far from being so extensive and universal a nature as a truly Christian love is. And as there is a monstrous disproportion in the love of some, in its exercises towards different persons, so there is in their seeming exercises of love towards the same persons. Some men show a love to others as to their outward man. They are liberal of their worldly substance and often give to the poor, but have no love to or concern for the souls of men, and so forth. Over here. And furthermore, it is a sign that affections are not of the right sort if a person seems to be much affected with the bad qualities of their fellow Christians as the coldness and lifelessness of other saints, but in no proportion affected with their own defects and corruptions. And here, by the way, I would observe that it must be laid down as a general rule that if persons pretend that they have come to high attainments in religion, but have never yet arrived to the less attainments, it is a sign of vain pretense. The same that has been observed of the affection of love is also to be observed of other religious affections. Those that are true extend in some proportion to the various things that are their due and proper objects. Okay, so this idea of the aesthetic quality of the moral life, and so as to hatred and zeal, when these are from right principles, they are against sin in general in some proportion to the degree of sinfulness. But a false hatred and zeal against sin is against some particular sin only. Thus some seem to be very zealous against profaneness and pride in apparel, who themselves are notorious for covetousness, closeness, and maybe backbiting and so forth. And there is much greater disproportion in the exercises of false affections than of true as to different objects, so there is also as to different times. Some times are more important than others. For although true Christians are not always alike, yet there is a very great difference at different times, and the best have reason to be greatly ashamed of their unsteadiness, yet there is in no wise that instability and inconstancy in the hearts of those who are true virgins. If therefore persons are religious only by fits and starts, if they now and then seem to be raised up to the clouds in their affections and then suddenly fall down again, lose all and become quite careless and carnal, and this is their manner of carrying on religion, if they appear greatly moved and mightily engaged in religion only in extraordinary seasons, in the time of remarkable outpourings of the Spirit, or other uncommon dispensations of providence, or upon the real or supposed receipt of some great mercy, when they have received some extraordinary temporal mercy, or suppose that they are newly converted, or have lately had what they call a great discovery, <laughs> I have new light for you, um, but quickly return to such a frame that their hearts are chief, chiefly upon other things and the prevailing bent, see there's that inclination, the inclination of their hearts and stream of their infections is ordinarily towards the things of this world when they are like the children of Israel in the wilderness. Okay. Okay, so you get the get the idea. And he will do the same thing in all the other positive indications of genuous religious um, affection. So, he has, I think, a view of things that we might want to keep in mind when we see uh, strange things happening when we re hear reports of strange things happening. We might want to be cautious 
we might not want to be measured. We might want to say, well, we don't understand all that's going on here, but it's not impossible that something good is happening. So it's, a, I think, a very, very uh, helpful and nuanced approach. Reminds me of the end of the first letter in the New Testament, right? First Thessalonians, I think, is the first document in the New Testament. It says, uh, do not quench the spirit, test everything, hold fast to that which is good. Test, 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 test. All right, any comments? Somebody wants to say something. I'm not sure that I want to, but I will anyway. Good. <laughs> Get us going. And, and Frank may have trouble summarizing and synthesizing much of what was said, so I'm not quite sure what the takeaway is as we walk out the door. Uh, on what he shared with us. I thought it was very conceptual, very psychological, very possibly observational. But what comes to my mind is that um, the fundamental question is we don't know how God does what God does. How he talks to us. Um, how he impresses us. Um, and we don't spend a lot of time, I think, thinking about it, maybe even talking about it. Uh, my thoughts more are move towards the science side of it rather than the psychological side of it. We know that we have a cognitive domain and an effective domain. We know that for analytical purposes you can put them in study and pull them apart and disseminate them but for function, for living, there's a constant interplay that you cannot separate them because that's how we design, that's how we made and that's how we function. And so my thought goes to when we say that we are blessed. What do we mean? How does God bless people? When God, we say, God spoke to me. What do we mean? How did God speak to us? I was filled with the Spirit of God. What, what, do, you, what do you mean? How does God fill the, uh, you with the Spirit of God? Oh, he spoke to me through my conscience. What conscience? Where does it exist? And how does that work? You see? Oh, God protected me with angels. I felt God's angels around me. What do you mean you felt God's angels around you? You see, there's a layer of questions here that get to our living and our godly experience that uh, um, I think we generally poorly understood. Now, the way that I try and approach this from more of a science point of view, for an example, would be um, God gave us a new heart as part of the, the, new, uh, the new covenant. I'm going to give you a new heart. What does he mean? He didn't give me a new pumper. I, my heart is a pumper. It's a physiological, an anatomical, physiological thing. Did God give me a new heart? No, he didn't give me a new heart. What he did do was give us an enlightened consciousness. And, and that it would, to me, it means that we have to understand more about what the covenant was. It, it, we're going to be more compassionate, more loving, um, more remorseful, more a high level of living than what existed. We have a, a whole new vocabulary uh, of, uh, that's developed about that time in, in, the Hebrew, in the Hebrew experience. So my thinking would be some way God had to tweak our DNA to give us more logic, more rationality, and more affection. We were different. The only way he can do that is through our DNA and it's through our mind, through our frontal lobe, through our parietal lobe. Something happened at that level if God was going to have us have a new heart as a new, as a new package of sensibilities that weren't previously manifest. That's how he's going to talk to us. That's how we're going to know. So I'm trying to find my way through this in some kind of physiological, yeah, neurophysiological way. I'm, thank you, because you said a lot of different things, and I'd like to respond at least in these ways. One, I think Jonathan Edwards is inviting us to be <coughs> not so dismissive. Not to be sure that things that are strange to us are necessarily demonic or um, deviant. 
I think that's a good takeaway. You know, just, just, just be quiet. Uh, and when Dr. Brandstater tells us something that seemed a little odd to us, well, we just listen. We don't have to pass judgment on it either way, but we listen. That's the first thing. The second thing I think we need to emphasize is that, in effect, Jonathan Edwards is saying, we can never know whether some impression we have is of God by the way in which it comes to our minds. The form of it is no, whether it comes to us while we are praying or singing or uh, whatever, um, in our encounters with other people, is the form of the message doesn't matter. So you don't, whether a person can hold a Bible up for X number of reasons or moments or breathe without breathing, all of that has nothing to do with anything. Uh, Edwards would say don't condemn it, but then don't take it as having any evidentiary value at all. Uh, the only thing that matters is the substance of what is being conveyed, not the form in which it is conveyed, but the sum substance of what is conveyed. <laughs> and to that we have to apply all of the normal tests of truth that we have, but particularly uh, consulting with our brothers and sisters in the church. I think that that's a very important point, and I have had experiences in my life when I've said to my colleagues, you know, I have this impression. Um, you think I should treat it as though it were from God or as though it were not from God? Mm -hmm. That's the way to put it. Mm -hmm. I'm not asking whether it's from God or not from God. I'm asking, should I relate to this impression I have as though it were from God or should I relate to it as though it were not from God? And I've gotten good help from my colleagues on that very matter. Um, and I will use to be not too disclosive here, I'll shift and use uh, Lou Benton as an example. One time when I was, when he was still the pastor of the church, I left uh, Griggs Hall and went over to the parking structure and pouring down rain, just pouring down rain. And he came out of the office, it was in, in the evening, dark, and uh, he, he came uh, out of the office and saw me there in the breezeway and he said, Dave, I, stop, I need to talk to you. So, sure. Um, and then he said, I have this strong impression that I ought to do this. And he mentioned a, a problem on campus that I knew something about. And he said, I, I just, before I plunge ahead into doing this, I want, I want to know whether you think this impression is one that I should follow up on. And I listened to him, and I said, Lou, I think so. Knowing what I know about that situation and listening to what you feel impressed to do, I think you should go ahead. Um, and uh, I, I, I really think that that sort of thing happens. Well, Karen, go ahead. I think that's very useful. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's very practical. It's very useful. Well, I have had occasions when people have said, you know, you, and said tearfully, you better listen to that. We don't know if it's from God or not, but you ought to treat it as though it were. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's, that's the way to, but if we really believe that God is active in every moment of every life, trying to bring about as much health and healing as possible, then we ought to try to be as discerning and non-judgmental, but also not gullible uh, in these matters. Um, I, um, <laughs> I saw my first babysitter at a funeral last Sabbath afternoon. She took care of me when I was just born, and she was about eight or ten. And I said to her, you know, I've really got to apologize because at your 70th birthday party, which was 10 years ago, I left before the party was over. And I know that your brother looked upon me with disapproval. And that's bothered me for the last 10 years. And I want to apologize to you. But I said, you know, there was another event going on that night in which the School of Religion had invited all of the faculty to meet at one person's home. But this was an African-American member of our faculty. And I felt strongly impressed to leave that celebration and go to that <coughs> faculty reading. And I, you know, I wasn't confident of it myself, but and I felt badly when her brother kind of looked upon me with disapproval. And, uh, but when I got there, here I found this family, 
African-American family, faculty of the School of Religion, have prepared this wonderful, wonderful event for all of us to be there. And I and one other person was the only one there, myself and Sigma Tonstad. If I hadn't gone, only Sigma would have been there. Now, was that the Holy Spirit? I don't know. But I treated it as though it were, and I'm glad it, I did. I just can't, the, the family was just hurt, just hurt. But how much more they would have been hurt if there were, had been only one person there, and not two. So, um, sometimes we, we have, I can tell you many, many stories like this, we have deep impressions, and though uh, we cannot say whether they are from God or not, but we can ask ourselves, should we treat this impression as though it were from God, or should we not? Yeah. And, I, and I think that that's, uh, and in order to do that, we need to keep in touch with each, other, which, with each other. On my syllabi, you know, it says, always think for yourself, never think by yourself. <laughs> always think for yourself, never think by yourself. Over here, Peter, you have the last couple. Very quickly, uh, thank you, Dave, for sharing uh, with you, uh, with us, our, uh, I, I mean, these reflections on Jonathan Edwards. Uh, you mentioned a couple of people that uh, I have a few reflections about them, and then quickly a summary of how I understood uh, putting together all these quotations that you gave us from him. Uh, you mentioned um, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Karl Barth, and I remember one uh, interesting thing that uh, in Germany during Hitler he was invited to give a lecture on uh, Christianity, and he was told you have to start your lecture with Hi Hitler, and uh, he, after a moment of reflection, he said, well, Christianity and Hi Hitler do not go together. Uh, another reflection that I have on Dr. Provorcia, uh, it was uh, the first class that I took in this country when I came with him, a class in ethics. Mm -hmm. And uh, one Sabbath day you mentioned that he told you that he was a Provence. Mm -hmm. uh, that means uh, he was born in Provence, a yeah. region in southern yes. France, yes. which was strong <coughs> in the Protestant religion. Right. And it was the country of the Huguenots. And if we look at their history, we understand, I mean, he came from, from strong Huguenot roots, and uh, I understood him uh, after you mentioned that, uh, the way he was thinking. Uh, now to sum up uh, quickly uh, what I understood from Edwards, from these quotations. Uh, what I understood is that uh, faith should not be confused, confused with, uh, with feelings. Uh, yes, it does include some feelings, but it's not all feelings. Right. If we are people of faith, we are not high all the time. Right. High spirits. Right. Actually, a uh, person of faith includes uh, in his uh, life experience <coughs> even some, some doubts. Right. And that is a sign of a healthy religion. Right. Like Jesus did. Yeah, this is what I sum up. But right. Right. Faith so, not but be Edwards want to make would make both of your points. On the one hand, religion is not mere feeling, but on the other hand, religion is in part good feeling. Yes. Now, that, that's the. Now, I just want to make a little fun footnote, and that is, it is so interesting to me to think about Dr. Provence's life because it is true that that uh, word goes back to Sir France and so forth. But he's not genetically related to any of them. Because the Provence family adopted his great grandfather from a family named Shepherd, <laughs> and you get a, a Peter Provence had all this artistic ability, and he bequeathed it to his uh, what do you call it, descendants, but they have no genetic connection to him. <laughs> So there's some some interesting thing about nature and nurture going on there, and I gather that the current thinking is that some environments will cause some genetic capacities to be more expressive than others. <laughs> because I've looked at all the shepherds, there isn't a bit of artistic ability in any of them. <laughs> One person did a few paintings that got sold at a 
firehouse. You know, it's terrible, terrible, terrible. <laughs> uh, but all the Provences, including my first wife, I have three children named Provence uh, and their middle names, they're all very, very artistic. How do you make that up? Okay, well, thank you, David. Very interesting discussion today. And by the way, you're, are you still working on the Provence? It's done. And it will be... Right, and we will have the obligation to read it. Oh, great. <laughs> and buy it. <laughs> Is that an obligation? Yes. <laughs> okay. And just remind you, uh, next week we will be dark here. We'll all be gathering in the main sanctuary. And then the week after that, uh, Dr. Brandstatter will be here. And then Dr. Brinsma. Okay, well, thank you. Dude. Let's have our benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.